We're at a fantastic little airport, Mountain Air, in the Blue Ridge of North Carolina. This airport combines a relatively short runway with high elevation, making takeoff and landings tricky. We're going to depart on a hot summer day with the Cessna 172 loaded up close to capacity. The performance tables tell us we should have plenty of runway for the takeoff and climb out, so we start out. Mountain Air has a cool feature where there are non-standard distance remaining signs on the right side of the runway. We're really struggling to get up to speed, but again, our performance tables told us we should be fine. The downslope of runway 14 should get us some extra speed here too. Even still, we struggle to reach rotation speed by the end of the runway. We're able to lift off but have a terrible climb out, and are struggling to stay above stall speed and hold altitude. Any adverse wind shear like we'd expect with this big mountain drop off, and we could drift right down into terrain. If there were any obstacles off this runway whatsoever, we'd have no hope of outclimbing them. Clearly, our performance calculations were off. Let's look at how we can reassess mid takeoff roll our performance and perform a rejected takeoff to get the aircraft slowed down and stopped in a safe way, with plenty of runway remaining. A terrific rule of thumb to use when flying general aviation is called the 50 70 rule. The FAA recommends that you establish a landmark halfway, 50% down the runway, and expect to be at least at 70% of your rotation speed by this point. If we're taking off from a runway with obstructions, it's recommended to be at 70% of rotation speed by the time we're at 30% of the distance down the runway. But let's stick with the 50-70 rule for this airport. Our Cessna rotation speed is typically identified at 55 knots. 70% of that is 38.5. Let's round up to 40 to be on the safe side. The runway is 2,900 feet long. Those distance remaining markers will help us identify the halfway point. There's one at the 1,350 foot point, which is close to half the runway distance. Some runways will actually have a sign or another indication of where the halfway point is. If you don't have an obvious reference, determine one yourself. You can even scout it out in Google Maps or something. So even if we determine during our pre-flight planning that we have enough runway to make our takeoff, we should plan to do what's called a rejected takeoff if we don't make at least 70% of our rotation speed by that halfway point. So how do we do a rejected takeoff? It's not something that's required on the checkride, but if you fly for any amount of time, you'll be doing a few of these to safely get the aircraft stopped. If you become a flight instructor, you'll probably be doing several of these every day. Your aircraft POH will detail how to get the aircraft stopped on the runway, but let's think of it very much like we do a short field landing. In both cases, we want to get the aircraft stopped in as short a distance as possible in a safe way. In both scenarios, there's a risk of losing directional control while getting stopped. When we're moving down the runway, the wings begin generating lift and weight is coming off the main gear. The brakes won't be as effective. There's a risk of locking up one of the wheels, which will cause a skid in the direction of that tire. Or even worse, we could have a tire pop and lose even more directional control. While we're braking, we want to make sure to get enough weight on the main wheels to make braking effective. We could do that with aerodynamic braking, bringing the elevator back and retracting flaps. So when we reach the midpoint and haven't yet hit 40 knots, we're going to reject the takeoff, bringing the power smoothly to idle, bringing the flaps up, applying brakes while bringing the elevator back. Bring the elevator back just enough so that we're not actually leaving the ground though. Here, we've gotten stopped in plenty of room, so there might not have been a need to break this aggressively. Use up some more runway if able, so we can go easier on the brakes and reduce that risk of locking up the wheels. We'll make the proper CTAF announcement and taxi back or leave the runway. At a towered airport, let the controller know what your intentions are. Rejecting a takeoff is important, of course, if we're not picking up speed and takeoff and won't pass the 5070 rule, but there are plenty of other reasons to reject a takeoff, like a loss of engine power an instrumentation failure, any kind of concerning vibration, a fire or a runway incursion, just to name a few. Seeing how quickly we were able to get our plane stopped safely, it's not really advisable to carry an emergency into the air and continue the takeoff in these small general aviation planes. But if you're committed to the takeoff, do so, fly the plane first, then troubleshoot the problem. Also, be deliberate about your decision. Plenty of accidents have happened due to so-called rejected rejected takeoffs where Power is reapplied and the takeoff recommenced with less runway available. Now that we got our aircraft stopped, let's look at trying this takeoff again, maybe using some best short field practices. We'll apply full brakes as we bring in full power, making sure our engine instrumentation looks good, and at this high elevation field, we'll lean for best power. That was what was hindering us in our prior attempts. Now, as we see, we'll reach our halfway point above our 70% rotation speed and be able to execute a good, safe departure and climb out at VX, which will transition to VY at safe altitude. 
Give these rejected takeoffs a try with your instructor. Take my word for it, any CFI will have plenty of experience under their belt getting an aircraft stopped mid-takeoff roll.